All right. So, um, okay. So it's a pleasure to uh, start this session with the three short research talks. And the first talk is uh, by uh, Yusuke Kawamoto, who is going to talk about homogeneous quasimorphism, zero topology, and Lagrangian intersection. Okay. Um, well, thanks for coming and thanks for giving me this opportunity. So um, the talk is, um, I'm going to talk about three things. So first, I'm going to go through the basics and talk about a bit of motivations. And then in section two, I'm going to state the main result, which is um, about quasimorphisms. And in the last section, I'm going to sketch the key idea which might be useful for people who's not interested in quasimorphisms as well. Okay, um, let me set some notations, first of all. So M omega is always a closed symplectic manifold, oh, monotone symplectic manifold. And H is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And Ham denotes the group of Hamiltonian homogeneous uh, ho diffeomorphisms. Now, um, a major theme in symplectic topology is the study of algebraic and topological properties of this group, Han. And um, I want to talk about two topologies that we're going to consider today. So the first one is the topology coming from the Hofer metric. Just to recall you what it is, um, Hofer metric um, is defined, is basically the least amount of Hofer energy you need to map one um, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism to another. And the Hofer energy is defined by the integral of the oscillation of a Hamiltonian. And the Cezor topology um, measures the furthest distance a point can be separated by two Ham diffeos. Um, so why do we care about C0 topology? It's, so it seems like C0 topology um, does have something to do with the symplectic structure, even though symplectic geometry is about smooth stuff. One sign is a theorem um, due to Eliasberg and Gromov, which says that if you have a sequence of symplectomorphism um, converging um, to a diffeomorphism in the C0 topology, then um, phi is a symplectomorphism, not just a diffeomorphism. And um, the relation between the Hofer metric and C0 topology is not um, really understood. So that's the reason why we care about those two topologies. Okay. So about the algebraic structure of the group Ham, one of the um, first groundbreaking results in this direction is due to Banyaga, um, who proved that Ham is a simple group. So, which implies that there is no non-trivial homomorphisms defined on the group Ham. Um, however, a lot, um, there, there exist quasi-morphisms on the group Han. So what are quasimorphisms? So intuitively, they're like, almost homomorphisms. To be more precise, um, a homomorphism, a homogeneous quasimorphism on a group G is a map that satisfies two properties. The so first one um, is that it's a homomorphism up to a constant error C. And second property it should satisfy is that it's um, homogeneous. So meaning that if you compose it k times, the value would be k times. Okay. And these maps are useful to study algebraic and topological properties of um, the group. So we want to find um, homogeneous quasimorphisms on the group Han. And there's um, a lot of results um, in this direction, but the construction that I want to focus on today is the one due to Antof and Podrovich. So Antof and Podrovich constructed homogeneous quasimorphisms by using a thing called uh, symplectic uh, spectral invariance, which 
is a quantity coming from FLIR theory um, for some symplectic manifolds that satisfy a certain condition, which is about the structure of the quantum cohomology. Uh, one thing I'd like to remark is that these Entov Poltorovich type quasimorphisms are Hofer Lipschitz continuous, but they're not C0 continuous. Okay. So the motivating question of the main result that I'm going to talk about later on is the following question posed by Entov, Poltrovich, and P. So they asked if there exists a um, non-trivial homogeneous quasimorphisms on Ham S3, that is C0 continuous. If yes, um, is it hofer lipschitz continuous? So here I'd like to consider the following um, alternative question. Does there exist a closed symplectic manifold which admits a non-trivial homogeneous cosmomorphism uh, that is C0 continuous? If yes, um, is it Hofer-Lipschitz continuous? Um, there's some results related to this question. So first of all, if we don't um, limit ourselves to um, close symplectic manifolds, then Antoff and Potrovich and P has found a C0 continuous and Hofer Lipschitz continuous quasimorphism on the for closed disk. And now uh, for closed symplectic manifolds, so far the example that is related to this question that I know is the following. Um, so Gambodo and Gis has constructed a quasimorphism that is C0 continuous. But th this example is not Hofer continuous. And this, uh, did I say that? Yeah, it's, so it's for closed surfaces, sorry. And the Hofer discontinuity was proven by Hanefsky. So to summarize, the, the, it seems like there's no example of a closed symplectic manifold um, for which there exists um, a cosmorphism that is C0 and Hofer Lipschitz continuous. And the main result um, that I want to discuss is that is to provide such examples for the two quadric and the four quadric. So um, to be more precise, so there exists non-trivial homogeneous cosmorphisms on the ham of Q2 and Q4 that are both C0 and Hofer Lipschitz continuous. Before outlining um, the proof, I'd like to um, explain the key idea of the proof, which is to work with um, different quantum cohomology rings. So, um, first of all, I I like to explain what I like to call a classical quantum cohomology ring. So, because we work with monotone symplectic manifolds. Um, the quantum cohomology ring could be explained um, in terms of by using the field of Laurent series, where this um, formal variable T that is used to express the series represents um, a sphere of minimal positive area and a minimal positive uh, degree. Uh, on the other hand, Recent developments in uh, flare theory suggest um, to work with a thing called the universal Novikov field instead of the Lorentz, a field of Lorentz series. So the universal Novikov field consists of formal series where this BK is a complex number and this large T is a formal variable having a real number on its right shoulder. Um, and this um, real number ten, tends to plus infinity. So this version of quantum cohomology ring, I'd like to call it a modern quantum cohomology ring in this talk today. So we have two different quantum cohomology rings. Um, there's some differences. The first one is about the algebraic structures. So they, they have different algebraic structures. One example, um, is so when we if you if we look at the modern 
In the classical quantum cohomology ring of CP2, it's a field. But uh, the modern one is semi-simple and it's split into a 2x sum of three fields. So it's, it's not at all a field. The algebraic structure changes. The second difference um, that I'd like to highlight is that they have different advantages. So it seems like if we want to work with spectral invariants, it's more convenient to work with a classical quantum cohomology. Um, the reason is that um, the classical quantum cohomology rings carries a Z grading and the Z grading brings um, the information of the action and the index to spectral variance. And combining those two informations are very useful. Um, on the other hand, if you want to use Lagrangian field theory, um, it seems like it's more convenient to work with a modern quantum cohomology ring because with the universal, universal nautical field, um, we have very nice superpotential theories. And superpotential theories are very useful to find Lagrangians of manifolds with non trivial Fleur homology. So um, that was the different, different advantages of these two quantum cohomology rings. Okay, now I'd like to outline the proof of the main theorem. So in the proof splits into two different parts. And in part one, I'd like to work with the classical setting. And in part two, I'd like to work with the modern setting. Um, so part one. So in fact, for quadrics, there are two different ends of Poltrovich type homogeneous cosmomorphisms. Let's call them zeta plus and zeta minus. Um, so that, and I define mu to be their difference. So mu equals zeta plus minus um, zeta minus. Um, so there are two continuity that we care about. One is the Hofer continuity, the other is a C0 con continuity. And the Hofer continuity follows immediately because as I said earlier, antov poltorovich type homogeneous cosmomorphisms are always Hofer Lipschitz continuous. So this, the difference is also Hofer Lipschitz continuous. So now we want to prove that it's C0 continuous. And this is done by um, using an early, an, another result of my from last year about the C0 control of spectral variance. And this result, uh, in order to prove this, I really need um, to look at the action and the index of spectral variance at once. So I really need the Z grading in an essential way. So that's the reason why I I want to work with classical setting in part one. So now, um, so we. But, uh, what, what does, uh, can, can you state uh, this result on C0 continuity of uh, this other result uh, from uh, 19? Sorry, right. I, I, C0 control of spectral invariant? Right, so in, it's going to be a bit technical, but I basically compare mu to um, the spectral norm. And um, last year, uh, what, what I was looking into C0 continuity of spectral norm. And I couldn't obtain the C full C0 continuity, but I, I, was, I managed to say that it's bounded um, around the C0 neighborhood of the identity. Mm -hmm. And in order to say this, um, I needed an estimate um, that uses both the in action and the index. Mm -hmm. So deep. Um, grading plays really an essential role here. So, thank I, you. Yeah. So, um, in part two, so we still have to say that mu is not identically zero. So, in order to say that, I want to say zeta plus and zeta minus are different. Um, and it, to say this, I use, um, I want to go to the modern setting. So in the spirit of Antov Potrovich's um, heavy and super heavy theory, it turns out that we, we only need to find two disjoint Lagrangians of manifolds with non-trivial Fleur homology. Sorry, uh, each with non-trivial, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so 
two Lagrangian submanifolds both having non-trivial flare homology and they're disjoint. Um, I want to use results um, of um, Kaya Ootaono and Nishino no Harawera, where they computed the super potential for toric degeneration uh, for symplectic manifolds emitting toric degeneration. And they have computed critical points and detected Lagrangian submanifolds having non trivial flare homology. And yeah, by using those results, I um, conclude that zeta plus and zeta minus are different. So, sorry, um, uh, these Lagrangians are uh, monotone. Uh, yeah, it, it turns out that they're monotone. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they have. Do they have? Uh, the same monotonicity, con uh, I mean, the same number of Maslow two disks through a point, or? Uh, no. Different, right? Yeah, um, the n equal two case, um, the Lagrangians are, uh, the two Lagrangians that um, um, FOQ has found is um, the anti diagonal, first of all. So Q2 is symplectomorphic to S2 times S2. One is the anti diagonal. Mm -hmm. And the other one called the exotic torus. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And in the n equal four case, they it's um, a tori, so torus T four, and the other one is diffeomorphic to S one times S three. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So. The, the, so in the proof, um, I really benefited from the different advantages the classical quantum cohomology ring and the modern quantum cohomology ring possess. So in part one I used, I worked with, I benefited from the classical setting and to set up the second one, I benefited from the modern setting. And this idea of combining the two um, have other applications. For example, it helps us to answer the question of Kotovich and Wu, and you can say some stuff about the Lagrangian intersection as well. So, I'm a bit early, but I'll finish my talk here. Thank you very much. So, uh, any questions for uh, Yusuke? Uh, maybe uh, could you explain? So, uh, in any, uh, assume that we work on any dimension, not necessarily two and four. Do you have good candidates for Lagrangian submanifolds, which distinguish between these two quasimorphisms? Um, um, no, uh, I had one, but it turned out to be not the case. Um, I, I would say that this is fantastic, so to say. So, so I can imagine that it's uh, difficult to to prove something. But uh, did you have you seen the paper by Asher and uh, Oakley? Or? Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. So um, there, there, there's a systematic way to produce disjoint Lagrangians of manifolds inside the quadrant, which yeah. is consider um, the Biran um, circle bundle construction, for example. Uh, or, or in other words, um, the Albers Flauenfelder construction. So you see quadric, you can obtain a quadric by a symplectic cut of the cotangent bundle of S2. Yes. And first of all, you have the sphere. And then you also have the, um, you know, the S1 times something coming from the geodesic flow. Yes, yes. And these two are disjoint, but Oakley, so I, I first thought that these two would be a good candidate for, you know, um, disjoint Lagrangians and manifolds having non-trivial flare homology. But um, Oakley Usher proves that this thing that is not in the zero section, the one coming from the geodesic flow is dis, 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 d
So we cannot have non-trivial thermology. So you, you, you know, one of the difficulties is that uh, if two Lagrangians have non-trivial self-floor homology or quantum homology, they have non-trivial quantum homology, and they are in the same Fukaya category, then they basically intersect. It's very mm -hmm. unlikely that they don't. I mean, I think it's maybe even a result maybe that they intersect because uh, category is unitary and somehow it's, uh, they intersect. And uh, so they have to be both uh, having non-zero fluoromology, but also be monotone and also be disjoint. So therefore in different Fukaya categories. Now, different Fukaya categories in this case means different numbers of mass of two disks. So that's where one needs to look first. And sometimes by really knowing the mass of two disks, you know if the floor homology is zero or not too. You see, then it becomes extremely intriguing because, okay, I can imagine that in, in dimension four, real dimension four, things are very special, but there is also example of Real dimension eight. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's a question from Paolo. Uh, yeah. So the okay, uh, Paolo, you can you can uh, mention your question, or I can read it. No. Okay, so Paolo is asking whether uh, you could sketch the difference between the two versions of quantum homologies that you use. Sketch the difference? Yeah, so explain what, what is the difference in some sort of more, uh, you know, uh, maybe intuitive way, maybe that's what he means? Uh, yes, it's just... I heard a voice at the beginning, but I couldn't hear the rest. So, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you. So, Paulo wants a more, like, a, he wants to feel more that these two are different things, right? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so basically, I like to you, I, I like to see the difference through th this example here. So um, the because of the degree restriction, the um, two n degree part is. I mean, sorry. There's roughly speaking the multiplication structure becomes more complex, more involved. So it really changes the algebraic structure, uh, if that means anything. There's more terms. Um, but uh, Yusuke, you could say like this, uh, you could say there is a map, right? From Lambda, from yeah. the universal Novikov ring, you can descend to the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and so basically, you could imagine that uh, using the general Novikov ring, you have the information kind of more uh, separated into pieces, and then yeah, it's yeah, yeah. compressed when you look to the other case. So that means that over the, uh, I don't know, Fourier, Laurent series ring, you, you have computations that are easier, but uh, you have more data over the other one. Somehow, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe would this make sense? What I'm saying, Paulo, your thing is not working too well. We don't hear you. We'll uh, we'll uh, agree that we don't hear you. So, you okay. What I said, does it make sense? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so did it make sense, to Yusuke, what I said? Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank you for this. Uh, let's see if there are other questions. Maybe uh, uh, if other. So, um, uh, no, uh, I don't see anything. Um, so, we still have a bit of time actually. If, uh, 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 so this other uh, result of yours about uh, this estimate uh, C0 uh, control, uh, so th this, uh, uh, you said that you, it, it was, uh, it became, um, is it an uh, archive maybe, or, um, so I should have known about it, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't follow close enough, but it's available, you mean? Yeah, it is available. All right, and what about this one of today? So this is also uh, written down or? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was recently put on archive. Oh, ah, okay, thank you very much, great. And so you mentioned some application to Lagrangian intersection, so maybe uh, yeah. you can say a word about it. Um, yeah, so, um, so it's a basically, there's two Lagrange's that has um, that is super heavy with respect to the two um, quasi uh, simple quasi state, and so the result is uh, states that if a Lagrange, if a given Lagrangian doesn't intersect neither of the Lagrangians, uh, it should have non-trivial, uh, trivial Fleur homology. Sorry, yeah. because if it did. Yeah, it should be super heavy with respect to either one of the Antaporovich type symplectic quasi state. Okay, thank you very much. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting result, and thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, I'm glad to see you. I haven't seen you in a very long time. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're getting ready for the next talk. So, uh, Egor, you're here, I've seen. So, you, you will introduce uh, correct? Yes, yes. So, uh, Shira, would, would you like to? Uh, uh, yeah, I can try to share my screen. Yeah. A moment. Can you see it? Yes, very good. Is it readable? Very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so I'm going to combine like uh, slides and writing. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, so, so, so maybe we can we can start right now. Uh, yes, so maybe okay. uh, there will be an extra minute. <laughs> so it's a, a pleasure to uh, continue with the talk of Shiratani, uh, who will talk about flare theory of this jointly supported Hamiltonian. Uh, thank you very much. So this is a work in progress joined with Yaniv Ganor, and here is a, sort of a plan for the talk. So I'm going to start with uh, explaining the motivating question and state some related works. Uh, then I'll fix the setting, the setting in which we work and uh, state several results. So these results can actually be seen as applications of, of a certain construction we have. Um, so I'll talk about that construction later and uh, explain how it gives sort of an answer to the motivating question. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me in any time. So in one sentence, this project is about understanding the Fleur complex of sums of disjointly supported Hamiltonians. So here H is approximating F and G, the sum of F and G, which are disjointly supported. 
So the picture is, uh, suppose in your symplectic manifold, you have two domains, U and V, this joint. And the Hamiltonian you consider is the sum of F, which is supported in U, and G, which is supported in V. So since the Fleur complex is generated by one periodic orbits, it splits as a vector space into a direct sum. So I can write as a vector space the Fleur complex of H as the sum of the subspace. So this is the subspace generated by orbits in U and then the subspace generated by orbits in V and then the critical points outside. Um, now the differential does not split into a direct sum. Otherwise the homology would split into a direct sum and you can show that this contradicts the fact that plural homology is independent of the Hamiltonian. But we can still try to say something about the differential in this setting. So this is like our main say motivating question. So we want to understand the differential for Hamiltonians which are given as, as sums of disjointly supported functions. Now floor theory of disjointly supported Hamiltonians or of sums of disjointly supported Hamiltonians was studied previously uh, mostly through spectral invariance. Now um, I don't have time to give a proper definition of spectral invariance so I'm going to give an improper one. So like roughly speaking, for a, a, given a class in the homology of M and a non-degenerate Hamiltonian, the spectral invariant of H with respect to, to alpha is the smallest action of a representative of alpha in the floor complex. So this is like the smallest action you need to represent the, the class alpha. Right. Now, um, the, the spectral invariance of, of sums of disjointly supported Hamiltonians were studied previously by Polterovich, Sefadini, and Ishikawa. So these works uh, establish upper bounds for, for such invariance. And then later on by Humilier, Leroy, and Sefadini, which established a max formula for the spectral invariant of the fundamental class. So they showed that if you have Hamiltonians supported in um, disjoint domains satisfying certain conditions, on a symplectically a spherical manifold, then uh, the spectral invariant of the sum with respect to the fundamental class is equal to the maximum over the invariance of the summons. Now I wanna mention that um, this max formula does not hold for a general homology class. So if you're familiar with the Poincaré duality property of spectral invariance, you can see that the, the class of a point satisfies a min formula. So the invariant of the sum is equal to the minimum over invariance of the summons. Um, and these, these max formula and min formula are somewhat intuitive if, if you think of uh, spectral invariance of the fundamental and point class as generalizations of maximum and minimum of the function. Right. Now in light of these results which study uh, floor theory of disjointly supported Hamiltonians through spectral invariance, we thought it'd be interesting to study the complex and the differential directly. So before I'll state the results, let me fix the setting in which we work. So from now on, we're gonna assume that all manifolds are symplectically spherical. And by that, I mean that omega and the first term class vanish on spheres, so on pi two of m. And the Hamiltonians are going to be uh, supported in this joint uh, embeddings of nice star-shaped domains in R2n into m. So I, I wanna say that you can actually do more generally than that. So we can consider domains with contact type incompressible boundaries. Incompressible means uh, that the map induced uh, on the fundamental groups by the inclusion of the boundary <coughs> to M is injective. Or in other words, uh, if you have a loop in the boundary which is contractible in M, it has to be contractible within the boundary as well. And we call these domains uh, CAB domains. So CAB is short for contact and compressible boundary. But if you don't wanna process this definition, simply think of embeddings of star-shaped domains. So under these assumptions, we have a construction of what we call a barricade, which limits floor trajectories from going in and out of the domain. Since the floor differential counts floor trajectories, uh, such a construction gives you information on the differential. So this relates to the motivating question uh, I mentioned in the beginning. 
Um, before I state, uh, like talk about this construction, uh, I want to state several applications of this construction to floor theoretic invariants, sort of to, to give some motivation. So my personal favorite application does not even concern disjointly supported Hamiltonians, but a single Hamiltonian supported in such a domain. And the claim is that its spectral invariants with respect to the fundamental and point class are independent of the ambient manifold. So I'm going to explain this on a picture first, and then I'll state the formal uh, claim. So suppose we have two symplectically spherical manifold, uh, m omega and n capital omega. And we have a domain v and m, CAB domain, which symplectically embeds into n. So here is the image of v. Then given a Hamiltonian f supported in v, we can push it to a Hamiltonian <coughs> in the image. So this is simply done by uh, composing F with the inverse of the embedding and extending by zero. So now we have two symplectic manifolds. We have a Hamiltonian in each one and we can compute their spectral invariants. So we can uh, compute the spectral invariant in M of F with respect to the fundamental class. So I remind you that this is the smallest action required to represent the fundamental class in the floor complex of F on the manifold M. And then we can do the same in N. So we have uh, the spectral invariant of this pushed Hamiltonian and the fundamental class here. And then the claim is that these two quantities coincide. Um, now, I want to say that this is not a trivial statement since spectral invariants are defined through floor homology, which is a global invariant. <coughs> but, but what I'm saying here is that uh, in, this, in this case, so on a spherical manifold and for CAB domains, uh, these invariants are actually local. So here's a formal statement. So I'm going to repeat it quickly. We have two symplectically spherical manifolds, a CAB domain in one of them, which when embeds into the other is uh, still a CAB domain. Then for every Hamiltonian supported in that domain, the spectral invariants with respect to the fundamental and same for point class uh, are the same in the two different manifolds. And another remark I want to make about this uh, statement is that the assumptions on the manifold being a spherical and this may be a little weird incompressibility condition on the boundary are actually necessary. So if you remove either one of them, the statement is not true and, and we have counterexamples. Now the rest of the applications of the construction I mentioned uh, concern compare floor theoretic invariants of disjointly supported Hamiltonians with those of their sum. So these are more in the flavor of the max formula I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm gonna go over these somewhat briefly, but if you want me to dwell on something, please just interrupt. So we have two Hamiltonians supported in this joint CAB domains, always on a symplectically spherical manifold. The first statement is an extension of the Max formula by Humilia, Lorenzo, Farini to a general homology class. So I told you that equality does not hold for a general homology class, but inequality does. The second statement concerns the boundary depth of Hamiltonians. So if you're not familiar with that, the boundary depth is essentially the largest action gap between a boundary term in the floor complex and its smallest primitive. So you can morally think of it as the size of the differential map in terms of action level. Or if you're familiar with the language of barcodes in floor homology, then this would be just the length of the longest finite bar. Now the statement is that the boundary depth of the sum is not smaller than the boundary depth of each summand. Um, so morally, this means that you cannot decrease the boundary depth by adding dynamics somewhere else in the manifold. The last application concerns uh, a new action selector defined by Abondondolo, Haug, and Schlenk. So I include here the definition for the case where the Hamiltonian is non-degenerate, but I don't really have time to give a proper presentation. So I'm just going to say this. So really roughly speaking, this, uh, this invariant is defined by the following minimax procedure. So you take, you consider homotopies, <laughs> of Hamiltonians starting at the Hamiltonian F. So the left end of the homotopy is F. And then you look at solutions of the S-dependent floor equations. So you have like cylinders, finite energy ones, say. 
So the left ends of these cylinders are one periodic orbits of this Hamiltonian F, right? So you take the minimum for each such homotopy, you take the minimal action of a left end of such a cylinder, and then you maximize over all homotopies. So morally, this is like the smallest value in the action spectrum that survives under all homotopies starting from F. So yeah, this was like quick and maybe unfollowable. In any, in any case, they ask in their paper whether this invariant uh, coincides with the spectral invariant of the point class. And in particular, whether it satisfies the min formula, like the one proved by Humilia Lorenzi Fadini for the spectral invariant of the point class. Now, this question about the min formula is motivated by another result uh, of Humilia Lorenzi Fadini. So they showed that on surfaces, and we're doing only on spherical manifolds, so surfaces other than the sphere, and for uh, autonomous Hamiltonians, every action selector that satisfies such a min formula coincides with the spectral invariant of the point class. So I should say that when I, when I write here action selector, I mean um, a continuous functional taking values in the action spectrum, which is not trivial in some sense. So our construction uh, enabled us so far to achieve an inequality. So we show that the, this invariant of the sum is smaller or equal than the invariance of the summons. Right. Um, now, now, as I already mentioned, the main, though not only ingredient in the proofs of, of these statements is a construction uh, that limits floor trajectories from going in and out of the domain. So this is what I wanna talk about now. Now this construction is motivated by a very, very simple picture in Morse theory. So let's start with that. So now we're in Morse theory and we have a, a Riemannian manifold and a domain B here. And I'm gonna draw another copy of it here. And we have a smooth function say supported in this domain. So maybe something like this. This will be F. We want to perturb it into a Morse function in such a way that will prevent negative gradient flow lines from going in or out of this domain. So the obvious thing to do would be to create a bump near the boundary, right? So now our perturbation will look something like this. So uh, let me maybe stress that what we did here is we created a bump. So this bump goes like all along the boundary. And let's look what happens to negative gradient flow lines of this function. So uh, a flow line starting at a critical point inside but away from the boundary, so not on this bump, is completely trapped in, in the domain. And even more so, is bounded away from the boundary. And the negative gradient flow line that ends inside can either start from a critical point in, in the interior part of the domain or from a critical point on the bump. But it could definitely not start outside, right? So let me spell these two properties for F. So for such perturbation, Uh, every negative gradient flow line that starts in V and not on the bump, so away from the boundary, is completely contained in V and even more so bounded away from a boundary. So I can, can subtract here a, a neighborhood of the boundary. And a flow line that ends in V is contained in V. By contained, I obviously mean that the image is contained. And I see that there is a question here. It's the standard way to compute uh, more homology of this, yes, of the relative, yes. Thank you. So, so uh, Octave is saying that this is the standard way to compute the more homology of the relative homology of uh, V and, 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 its, uh, boundary, and its boundary. So but what I wanna say here is, because, so this relates to, to this comment that we don't have a complete separation between the inside and the outside, right? So basically flow lines that start on this bump can flow both in and out of the domain. And this is expected because we know we don't expect to, to have a, a direct sum of the homology here. So the Morse uh, differential does not split into a direct sum as well. So our construction is 
basically enables you to achieve uh, these two restrictions, one and two, in floor theory, so for floor trajectories. So here's the theorem, and I'm labeling it as theorem zero because logically it appears before the previous results. So this is like a component of the proof. So we have a Hamiltonian supported in a CAB domain in a symplectically aspherical manifold. And then we claim that there exists a perturbation of this Hamiltonian and an almost complex structure such that for every negative gradient flow line of the corresponding action functional, so for every solution of the corresponding flow equation, we have these two restrictions for the flow trajectory for the solution. So if it starts in, in the domain uh, and away from the boundary, it is trapped in that region. And if it ends in V, then it's contained in V. And here's an illustration of the allowed and forbidden trajectories for this pair. And as for terminology, um, for, for such a pair F and J, such that uh, one and two hold, <coughs> so these property hold, then uh, we say that this pair has a barricade around the boundary. So the barricade is like the analog of the bump from the Morse case. Right. And I also want to mention that uh, this theorem holds for homotopies as well, homotopies of Hamiltonians, and then the solutions are of the S-dependent flow equations. So uh, naturally having such restrictions on flow trajectories, um, you can uh, derive information on the floor differentials. So let's look at that. So to see that you have to, con you consider the, the following direct sum decomposition. Uh, I'm gonna illustrate it on a picture sort of to make it visible. So we have here the boundary of V and here we have a neighborhood of the boundary in which we created this analog of a bump. And then the first summand uh, is generated by possibly non-constant one periodic orbits in this interior region. And then the second summand is generated by critical points outside. And the third is generated by critical points on this bump. And then under this decomposition, the differential takes uh, a diagonal block form. So you can see it here. And uh, I also wanna say that when I write differential restricted to V, I mean that it counts uh, only trajectories that are completely contained in V. So this, this map really does not see anything that happens outside of V. Right. Um, so, so in some sense, this answers the, the, the motivating question. So we, we considered Hamiltonians which are localized in some sense. So they are supported in some disjoint unions of domains. And I should say that I do not assume the domain V to be connected here. And, and we wanted to know how the differential looks. We, we know that it's not, it does not split into a direct sum, but here we have uh, sort of a, a diagonal block form. Now, do I have another minute or so? How much time do I have? I don't know. You have an, at least another two minutes. Great, so uh, I'll say a word about the proof. Um, so in order to achieve, to sort of to, to uh, have this bump from the Morse case to adapt it to the floor case, we need a context structure on the boundary. So suppose this is the boundary of the domain. Uh, so if we have a context structure, we can construct this bump with respect to the um, radial or Liouville coordinate, which is defined in a neighborhood of that boundary. So, so we have the Liouville coordinate and we can construct <laughs> sort of such a bump. And then in order to rule out, say for example, uh, entering trajectories. So suppose we have a, a floor trajectory going from a critical point outside X minus to a one periodic orbit inside. In order to rule out such a trajectory, we compare the action of the starting point X minus and the action <laughs> of the loop obtained. So this is the loop obtained as the intersection of the cylinder with the boundary of V. So, you, so the claim is that you can use the uh, incompressibility of the boundary and the context structure to show that the action of this gamma is larger than any possible value for the action of, of the critical point outside. So this will be larger than 
the maximum of F over the complement of V. F is the Hamiltonian. And here, you, so you have to choose the perturbation carefully in order to arrange this to happen. But this can be made to happen. So naturally, uh, um, like a main piece of the proof is <coughs> estimating the action of, of this loop. And here you can already see uh, what breaks in the presence of spheres. So, no, I'm not using neck stretching here. Yes, so uh, I should say that there are sort of similar computations uh, made by, done by uh, Silibak and Awancha in their paper where they prove, uh, like they, they consider axioms of uh, symplectic homology and they use neck stretching. So they do it in, in the setting of completed Liouville domains and they use neck stretchings in, in their computations and we don't. Uh, stretching neck, neck. <laughs> yes, uh, I have a bunch of uh, funny caricatures uh, from when the time when Yaniv uh, really suggested to use neck stretching. Um, yeah, so we sort of managed to do that with, with like elementary computations. Um, right, so I, I was about to say that this is where uh, everything breaks, I mean, this is one point, when things break in the presence of spheres. So if, if the manifold is not a spherical, the maximum of the function on the complement is no longer an upper bound for the actions of critical points, right? Yeah, so this is uh, all I wanted to say, so thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. So, um, uh, are, are there any how questions? How do you clap on that? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, you, you mentioned a, a few slides back that there, there was mm -hmm. some sort of comparison between the max or the min formula that we have and, and the one for this. Uh, and something for uh, the action selector of yeah. uh, Dundalo, Hart, uh, and Schlenk. This one. So you're saying their action selector, actually, you don't know if it satisfies the mean formula or the max formula? They don't know. So this action selector, you, th you should think of it as, as like an analog for the, the spectral invariant of the point. So, so the sort of a, a question is whether it coincides with the spectral invariant of the point class. And okay. then to get a partial right. answer, you want a min formula. If it satisfies some sort of minimal set of axioms, then they coincide. So what axiom, uh, what is the property that's missing? The right. min formula. The min formula is the property that's missing. I mean, oh. the max formula in your language. All right. paper. So min for, oh, okay, so I see. The min formula was important in your yeah, so this is like the missing piece to know uh, at least the answer for surfaces and autonomous Hamiltonians. Okay, great, thanks. And yeah. I understand. Uh, uh, one more question if there's time. So, so there was kind of an initial motivation for these max or min formulas was applications to these Poisson bracket invariants uh, or mm -hmm. it for, uh, for covers and maybe uh, the ones of Bohovsky uh, and Tal Kotrovich. Uh, do, do you guys have some applications to Poisson bracket invariants? So um, these results don't give an, improve, an improvement of the known applications. So basically, say more or less, uh, for, the for the fundamental class, we don't extend your result with uh, Humilia, Lero, and Sifadini. So with Humilia and Lero, right? So we don't. Yeah. And so for, as, as far as I understand, for applications uh, for Poisson bracket invariants, you're interested in the, in the fundamental class. That's the, the fundamental class. Um, but you do have some applications for, so, so actually you can derive some, some information through the, the first uh, statement I mentioned. So this, the one about the locality, so this one. Mm because uh, you can use this statement basically in order to have um, uniform upper bounds for spectral invariants of domains, which can be embedded, say for example, into Rn, into R2n. So if, you, if your domain is, can be embedded into R2n, 
then you know that it is displaceable there and you have uh, the displacement energy there as a uniform uh, upper bound. And then you can derive, so yeah. Okay. So, so this also gives applications to uh, the notion of uh, super heavy sets, for example. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Shira, in your argument, when you say that uh, this uh, tube coming from outside the domain comes and hits a uh, boundary uh, after you put a contact structure on the boundary and then it hits into uh, some orbit there. Mm -hmm. uh, the orbit you mean is just the uh, intersection of the tube, you know, in the naive sense. It's uh, just an orbit. Uh, it's, it's in the naive set, sense, uh, but in general, it's like, uh, it's not even a single loop. So in general, it's a single set. loop. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But, uh, but it's not like uh, the orbit of a specific uh, Hamiltonian and uh, I mean. No, that, no, no, no. Uh, it's, just, it's just a loop. So yeah, I see. this okay. is actually a point we've been, like it took us a, a little bit of time to, to be willing to compute the action of just a loop that is not related to asking. any dynamics. That's why I'm asking. I'm asking because generally when you, so we see many pictures like this, but in all these pictures, actually the orange loop uh, it has some dynamical yeah. meaning, and meaning related to the, some some uh, action functional. And, uh, I mean, yes, yes. So no, it's just all right. interesting. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So let's see if there are many maybe other questions here. I'll uh, take a look. Um, so let's uh, thank Shira again. I think there are no other questions right now. So I'm going to stop the sharing. Yeah, great. Ah, I see the sub is here. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. I had a moment of uh, worry at, 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 at some point. So um, you could try your, uh, 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 so Shira, thank you very much again for this very nice talk. And uh, also for you and for uh, Yusuke, please uh, send me your PDFs uh, or a link of the PDFs and uh, for you, Sabi, too, a link okay. of the PDFs or the PDFs themselves That's after, the, after the seminar. And uh, Sabi, let's try your, uh, your screen sharing to make sure it's all good. Mm. Okay. Perfect, great. All right, and uh, we have a sort of. Uh, are you are you ready to start? Yeah, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we do. Uh, you have a T-shirt that uh, matches your slides. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Good planning. <laughs> um, so um, I think. Uh, we're going to start. I think we are two minutes early, but uh, I don't think this is very uh, problematic. So uh, we will start. Uh, so our uh, next and last speaker today is uh, uh, Xavier Martinez Aguinaga. Is this fine? With yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who's going to speak about formal Legendrian and horizontal headings? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Octav. Um, thank you for having me here. This is joint work with uh, Eduardo Fernandez and Francisco Presas. So I'll start with a brief introduction, <clears throat> just for putting things in context. So when we study uh, Legendrian submanifolds in general, or Legendrian nodes <clears throat> in R3, um, we can consider the space of formal Legendrians that I, <clears throat> I will introduce later. But just to show that the study of this space is meaningful, I'll try to show how <clears throat> it interacts with the space of Legendrians. So this is a weaker version of what we understand by, by a Legendrian. It's a bigger space. And so we have this in classroom and we can study the 
the corresponding morphisms at homotopy groups between these two spaces. So just uh, to say, imagine that we have a certain element in homotopy here. If this is the inclusion, well then, induced map. Then we can consider <coughs> the class corresponding to the inclusion. So if, for example, we pr can prove that this is non-zero, this uh, would prove that the, the element in homotopy in the Legendrian space is indeed non-zero. So this is a way of assigning, in a certain sense, some invariants that we call formal invariants, which is um, <clears throat> seeing these classes or regarding them as elements in this bigger space. Um, we, can, we can play the same game, but instead of uh, studying Legendrians, studying horizontal embeddings, which are embeddings tangent to angle distributions in R4, and we have uh, the formal horizontal embeddings. And indeed, uh, there is a result by Casals and Del Pino, which shows that <clears throat> indeed uh, this is a weak homotopy equivalent. So it shows that if one wants to study homotopy groups of the space of horizontal embeddings, it tantamount to studying uh, formal, uh, the homotopy groups of the space of formal horizontal embeddings. So this shows that the study of uh, these formal spaces of uh, embeddings is indeed meaningful. Um, well, in the case of horizontal embeddings, for example, it shows that uh, it's equivalent the study of homotopy groups of one to the other. So I've just stated some philosophical ideas, but I've not uh, introduced what a formal Legendrian embedding is. So let's do that. So formal Legendrian embedding in R3 is a pair gamma, comma, Fs, satisfying the following two conditions. So gamma is an embedding in the usual sense, a smooth embedding. And then we have Fs is a one parametric family, uh, the parameter living in the interval, such that F0 coincides with the original derivative of the embedding, and F1 lies in the distribution. So we have the following local picture. If this is, for example, gamma of t, and this is gamma prime of t, let's say that we have here the contact distribution at that point. So, um, the notion of formal Legendrian doesn't require the derivative to lie in the distribution, but indeed what we have is that there exists certain vector here, which uh, lies in the distribution, and we have a connecting homotopy here, F of t. So this is the idea of what a formal Legendrian is. The, our embedding doesn't have to leave uh, to line its derivative in the distribution, but we have a connecting homotopy. It's like a weaker version, and we'll study this space. So in order to, to compute or to study the homotopy groups of this space, we consider this uh, auxiliary space, which is the forgetful Legendrians, formal Legendrians, which consists in pairs, which are gamma, which is an embedding here, and then we have F1. F1 plays the role of the previous Fs, but now we forget um, the connecting homotopy. We just, uh, we just require the F1 to be a map from S1 to, well, I, I write F maps from S1 to S1. Indeed, the second S1 is, um, we can identify psi with R2 minus, F minus zero if we, if we require the derivative, uh, well, to be non-zero, and we can trivialize psi with a suitable trivialization, and so we can regard it as S R2 minus zero, and this is like S1 if we just think in unit vectors. So we have maps from S1 to S1, and so we have the natural vibration that takes formal Legendrians into the space of forgetful Legendrians, formal Legendrians, 
and the fiber is very well understood. It's a uh, patch connecting, if we take uh, the fiber over upon gamma gamma prime, Alexandrian fiber. Then it's uh, loops that starts, start at gamma prime and finish at gamma prime. That's the loop space of maps from S1 to S2. And so the observation here is that we have a vibration where the base, which is this one, is very well understood. It, it's had, it has the homotopy of embeddings from S1 to R3. And then maps from S1 to S1 is S1 times C. So we very well understood, understand this space. And the fiber is all, also very well understood. And the computation of its homotopy groups is straightforward, and it can be described in terms of the homotopy groups of S2. So what we get is the we have the following exact sequence of homotopy groups associated to the vibration. I've already replaced the, the corresponding homotopy groups of S2. And so here we can get some results already. For example, uh, it's not difficult to see that this is the connecting pieces from here. That's that we recover this uh, very well known result that it's that formal Legendrian embeddings are classified by their topological type as parameterized nodes, their rotation number, and their Thurston Bennett can vary. Sorry to come back again here. So this is the rotation number of the node. And then here we have another C that it's not exactly the thurston venecan but this C together with the rotation, they, they encode this information, rotation and thurston venecan But we can also study what's happening at, sorry, at this line. And this gives rise to the following theorem. And it's just that the first eight sequence relating uh, the, the, the pi one of the space of formal Alexandrians can be described in terms of pi one of the space of embeddings, smooth embeddings. This, of course, can must appear there. It's what it's expected. And then we have um, a C here that I'll describe later, and some other two invariants here. Uh, this M is unknown in general, but for certain connected components, for those nodes and for unknown nodes, we have proven that indeed this is a C. And we can play the same the same game. I've not defined the, the analog uh, concepts for, for horizontal embeddings, but it's just the same. It, you can define it in the same fashion. And you get that the pi one of formal horizontal embeddings uh, can be described in terms of the smooth topology of the smooth embedding space. And then you have another C here and C2 here. So I'll try to give a um, geometric interpretation of uh, these formal invariants. I'll start with, sorry, with this C here, which it's what we call the road by one um, of, a, of a loop. So if we have a certain knot, for example, I'll draw a Lechantrian trefoil. And we take, for example, here, this is the origin. And this is the, the derivative uh, at that point. If we consider what the, um, this derivative is doing when we wrote, when the the loop takes its place, we can measure how many turns it makes with respect to a certain trivialization of psi. And that's what we call the rod by one. Rod by one, rod gamma theta, is the degree of theta So it's just focusing on one point, for example, the origin, and measuring how many turns it makes with respect to, to the distribution. That's what we call the rod by one. And so, as I mentioned before, if one of these invariants is non-zero, then it's just proving that the, the loop itself is non-zero. And so, this allows to, to construct uh, an infinitely, infinitely many examples of uh, loops of Legendrians 
that are smoothly trivial, but are non-trivial as loop of Legendre embeddings. So I've depicted here in the picture, um, this is a loop of unknots, but you can do the same, the same game with any Legendre knot. So you take its Lagrangian projection, like the one here, and you just rotate it in the usual sense. And you can, def you can define a loop in this, in this way. You rotate it in n times, let's say. And so the, the observation here is that this loop, that we can define it in terms of certain matrices, the matrices that correspond to rotating with respect to this axis. So the loop is defined as a theta. And this is our, our knot. So this loop of matrices keeps in pi one of SO3, since it's a rigid rotation in the three dimensional space. And pi one of SO3 is C2. So what this tells you is that if you rotate it an even number of times, this loop of matrices is indeed zero as, a, as a, in pi one. So if the loop of matrices uh, has a capping, it's trivial, then you uh, you just make this capping act on the on the knot and you get uh, that the, the loop you have defined is also trivial. So this proves that uh, every number of even turns you make uh, to a certain knot uh, gives you a trivial loop of knots, but uh, for obvious reasons, the, the rod by one correspond exactly to the, how many turns are you making. Therefore, you get uh, as many loops of Legendrians as you, as you wish that are smoothly trivial, but Legendrian non trivial. Um, so I'm going to, I'm coming back. Well, I will write it here. We had this exact sequence. As I mentioned before, we get here CN. So this is the road by one I've just described. Um, okay. So I will describe now this invariant assuming that the smooth knot type of the loop is trivial. So if I have here gamma theta, and let's say that it's zero here, and it's zero here, and I will describe this other invariant. So it works as follows. Okay, let's take here. This is gamma theta of zero. So this is parameterized by theta. And since this is zero, this means that, uh, well, sorry, this is gamma prime, the derivatives. This is telling you that there exists a smooth capping here of derivatives. I mean, each point represents the derivative. So as it's zero here, it means that it's capable. But okay, now you have here the interpolating family, which is fs of t of zero. This is f1 of zero. Well, I've defined previously the rod by one invariant in terms of actual Legendrians. But for the formal Legendrian, you define it in the same fashion. It's the degree of the F1 zero. So if you are saying that this is zero here, it means that it's uh, trivial as a, its class is trivial as a loop of maps from S1 to S1. So you can find here a capping of derivatives in the distribution. And so, what you get here is a whole is two.
And so each point, as I, as I mentioned, represents a vector in R3, which is the derivative. So if you take just this vector and you see it uh, as a unit vector, just taking its wrong one, this provides a map from S2 to S2. Yeah, you can call this map G. So the invariant, uh, this C, is exactly corresponds to the degree of this map associated to a certain loop. So this is the, the invariant corresponding to that C. And so as an application, we get the, that we can prove the non-triviality of previous examples in the literature using the, this invariant. Mm. So Thomas Kalman prove, provided inf infinitely many examples of loops of Legendrians, which are smoothly trivial, but non-trivial in the space of Legendria. Um, we've, I've depicted here a loop um, for certain torus nodes. He described it for uh, infinitely many torus nodes, well, for all positive torus nodes. Um, so this, this loop described here in the front projections, well, this is just part of the loop. You have to concatenate it several times, and it corresponds to taking one strand of the loop and putting in the next one and doing, doing so for, for all the strands. And the smoothly, this is homotopic to a rotating a two pi rotation of the of the knot in the supporting torus, and so it's smoothly trivial because of the same reason I explained before. It's uh, well a space of yeah, it's 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 it can be described uh, as a loop uh, generated by the loop of matrices, which is trivial in the space of matrices. So, uh, but he proved that it's indeed non-trivial in the space of Legendrians, and he did it using invariants coming for, from the study of pseudo-holomorphic curves uh, by his monodromy invariant, which is, uh, well, yeah, and he proved that it's non-trivial. So with, what we've done is proving that then these loop, loops of nodes are indeed uh, non-trivial in the space of formal Legendrians, um, we've done so uh, providing a geometric description of, well, a path inside of the space of formal Legendrians, and then reducing the computation to this uh, invariant I described before, the pi 2 invariant. So I'm going to give the idea. I'm not going to enter into so many details because we, I don't know where yeah, we don't have many times, much time. So uh, the idea is the following. We take the, the torus knot, it's depicted here. And I, did, I, I have here in red the front projection of the supporting, the, the core of the supporting torus. So the first step is to make the, the, the torus not C1 close to the, to the supporting core in such a way that it, yeah, it's C1 close. And so we can work as all these invariants are related to derivatives. We can just forget about the knot in some sense and, and work with the, with the original knot, with the torus knot, but with the unknot, which is uh, the core of the, of the torus knot. So, uh, derivatives, well, a certain for, oh, it says that my internet is not working well. Can you hear me correctly? Okay. That's good. That's good. Thank you. So what we do is uh, we construct a path of loops in, inside the space of formal Legendrians, decoupling the, the derivative. This is a step two into a constant derivative. This can be done since the rod by one of the, of the loop is zero. And then by several st uh, steps, what we do is uh, we undo the slope of the unknown in order to put it in a simplified position, as you can see here. In such a way that, uh, yeah, that we get, uh, we can do now our computation in an in, in an easier way. And so, yeah, with this, I, I finish the talk and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Bobby. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Um, so I don't see anything on uh, chat. 
May I, may I ask if you can do similar things for transverse knots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed, this is uh, some work in progress, and you can play the same game, and yeah, you you obtain same similar results for for transverse knots. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So I, I wonder, in uh, some situations, you can uh, speak about positive parts of Legendrians. And so then there is a question about this uh, positive loops and homotopies of uh, po posi positive loops in the class of positive loops. So is there any chance to build some formal theory in the spirit of each principle or something which could solve this? Mm, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Um, I, I, I guess you can define what, yeah, a positive loop, uh, a formal positive loop, but uh, I don't know if there is, yeah, much to say. I have no idea of uh, the formal analogs or, yeah, thank you. Um, maybe there are more questions. Um, I have another question, if you don't mind. <laughs> Why did you stick to loops? So, I mean, in principle, you can look at higher homotopy groups. Or well, this is not interesting. Or, I mean, could you say it again, please? No. So, why why did you calculate only pi one? So, what about pi two and so on? Um. Yeah, you can, well, the, the thing is you have to study these diagonal maps, but you can just do the, sorry. But yeah, you can you can uh, study the, the same for, for higher homotopy groups. Right, you can get some answers. I guess so, but uh, I don't know, for example, any exam any interesting example of, uh, yeah, but you can do it. Yes, yes, yes. So do you know an example of sphere, which is non-trivial among Legendrians, but trivial is smooth? I mean, just, just some generalization. Yeah, well, this is some work in progress now. Mm, we've been looking for a, a loop of, well, just at pi one, but now we are getting some, some guesses in higher homotopy also. Uh, we've been looking for a loop of Legendrians that is formally trivial, but Legendrian non-trivial, since all the examples we, we have are, are formally non-trivial. And we have uh, proven, we have a sketch of proof. That I don't, I also don't, don't want to say too much and then maybe, but the idea is that formal invariants uh, may classify loops of knots and and probably higher homotopy groups. But yeah, I don't, I don't, this is just work in progress and we have to understand something. Sure. Okay. We Thank have you. a sketch of proof, but not, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, uh... Great. Uh, let's see, maybe there are some more questions. Um, I uh, don't see anything new on chat. Um, so, so, sorry, Le Leonin, I, I don't know if you asked me about formally trivial, but legendary non trivial, or smoothly trivial, legendary non trivial. I, well, I had in mind smoothly trivial, but Legendrian. Uh, ah, and, yeah, that that the answer is is yes. We we so can but for higher spheres. For higher but, spheres, we have proven, for example, uh, that the group of contactomorphisms uh, is uh, it injects in the space of Legendrian embeddings, for example. So 
yeah, you can get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood you. In 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 what case uh, the group of long yeah in S three in S three in S three yeah yeah when the manifold is not S three things become yeah different and more complex. But it's still uh, okay. Okay. I don't know if I just showed the references, but maybe I should put them just to yeah. Okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, Fran has a question. Oh? Okay, Xavi, it's just for you to give, give some more information. C can you explain what is the expectation? To, to say that the, in standard S3, the expectation is that you have kind of probably not full HP, well, of course not full HP, so there is high node level in which everything fails. But say that in S3 standard, like the case of contact structure and contact homorphies, there is an expectation of having a full H principle. This is what you are trying to, to say, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I didn't want like, but yes, that, that's the idea, that you get an injection uh, from the Legendre space. Sorry? Yeah, more than injection, probably by injection. For for k bigger than two, for pi two and so on. Okay, for, pi for one. one you don't have surjectivity, but for greater k, k maybe yeah. yeah. And also, could you explain that parameterize is the natural thing to do when you are speaking of HP, but but somehow uh, to go from parameterize to non-parameterize takes a while because you have to check, for instance, to prove non-triviality that for all the parameters yeah. say non-trivial. Hmm. This takes a while. Yeah, Maybe I yeah that's a good point. Yeah, indeed, what we are. Sorry, Frank. So, yeah, Frank said that all this is uh, in the in the category of uh, parameterized nodes and parameterized loops. So, the thing is that. When, for example, for proving uh, that certain loop is non-trivial, you must check that all, for all parameterizations is indeed non-trivial. And this is, uh, yeah, this requires work. For example, for the case of the loops of, uh, of Thomas Kalman, we should prove that for all parameterizations, this is the case. And different parameterizations provide, uh, yeah, different examples. So. I don't know, Fran, if this answers what you wanted, but yeah, yeah, you have to prove it for every parameterization. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to mention that we are using parameterization because it's what is natural when you are speaking of H principles, because H principles refer to maps. So you have to have maps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, map. yeah. So you need to add a parameterization, a parameterization in order to have a map. I was just trying mm -hmm. to, to point out that thing. Okay, thank you, Sherry. No, thank you. Thank you, all, you all, for all the questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Fran, also for the comment, and thank you, uh, uh, Sabi, for your uh, ni very nice talk. Um, let's see, maybe there are even more questions to come, or comments, or uh, things. I don't see on chat or other things. No, I don't think there are. So in any case, we are now uh, very close to our uh, uh, end time for today. Uh, so don't forget, we also have a talk next week. So uh, everyone should show up for the next week talk. And uh, the speakers of today, please don't forget to send me your uh, slides and I'll uh, try to, or a link for them. I, I don't really need the files, but uh, I'll, I'll post them as soon as I can. And uh, thank you all for coming today and thank you for the, to the speakers for the very nice talks. And uh, I hope to see you all uh, <laughs> still, of course, through Zoom, but next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, bye bye. So I'll, I'll still stick around a bit, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
it's formally over for today.